Hi, I'm Samantha Saren, a board certified behavior analyst with Brett Denovi and Associates. Today I'm going to be talking about behavioral momentum. The task list states that we need to be able to define and provide examples of behavioral momentum. Behavioral momentum is one of those things that I feel like a lot of us are familiar with, but not necessarily able to define well technically. Like we can use it in a sentence, might know what somebody's kind of talking about, but as far as being able to provide a technical explanation, um, that's what my aim is today. It's a what? Good job! Yay! So let's start with the definition. So in one of the original articles from 1988 on behavioral momentum, Behavioral momentum is defined as the tendency for a behavior to persist following a change in environmental conditions. If we look at that definition and kind of cut it in half, looking at the first part where we have the tendency for a behavior to persist. So we know we're talking about reinforcement. And we know that because reinforcement being the likelihood for a behavior to happen again in the future, if we're talking about a behavior persisting, that behavior is has been reinforced. If we look at the second part of the definition, following a change in environmental conditions, we know that we're talking about either um, a manipulation of antecedent stimuli, so maybe a, dis a discriminative stimulus um, that no longer signals uh, that reinforcement is available, or a change in the consequences, so perhaps a, a punishing outcome that was in place previously is not in place anymore. All right, so since we have a bit of a better understanding of what exactly we're talking about with behavioral momentum, let's talk about how likely it is for it to happen. Behavioral momentum happening is based on the response strength of the behavior. And we know that the response strength is determined by the rate of reinforcement, right? So if a behavior has a strong history of reinforcement, either like very, you know, strong qualitatively reinforced, very uh, large quantity of reinforcement, very consistently reinforced, all those factors that go into rate of reinforcement. If a behavior has that response strength, then it's more likely to persist even when environmental conditions change, which we've said is what we're talking about here, behavioral momentum. So with all of that, let's talk about behavioral momentum as an intervention. So how can we as behavior analysts use this to our advantage when we're writing treatments for our individuals? One of the most common behaviors that behavioral momentum is used for is non-compliance. So if we take a look at non-compliance, what's, what's kind of cool actually, there are studies that show that when non-compliance is successfully intervened on, uh, meaning that it, compliance increases, rates of other targeted behaviors like aggression or SIB or property destruction, those also show a decrease. So intervening on, on non-compliance potentially has social significance beyond just um, the immediate intervention and what we're targeting. What's also cool about using behavioral momentum for non-compliance is that alternative interventions like guided compliance, assisted compliance, or even overcorrection are considered restrictive in many ways. Whereas using utilizing behavioral momentum is inherently positive. Can I have a high five? Good job! Hands up! Behavioral momentum as an intervention typically looks like three or four oh, high probability requests preceding a low probability request. Go to the kitchen! So what do I mean when I say a high probability request? It's a request that the individual has a history of being very likely to be compliant with. Behavioral momentum as an intervention typically looks like three or four high probability requests preceding one low probability request. A high probability request is something that the individual is likely to comply with. It does not have to be a demand that is necessarily easy for the learner, but it usually is a prompt for a low effort mastered response. For example, Oh, good job, touch your forehead. Oh, good job, do this. You would issue three or four of those requests the learner demonstrates compliance with each of them, and then you would issue the low probability request. You do not want too much time between the high probability requests and the low probability requests. You are hoping to make the most of the momentum 
of the compliant responses, so a brief inner response time between requests is crucial in order to capitalize on the high P requests functioning as discriminative stimuli for previously reinforced behaviors. All right, so one thing that's important to remember when using behavioral momentum as an intervention is that is what we talked about previously. So how likely is behavioral momentum to happen is based on the response strength of that behavior. So looking at the reinforcement that has been provided previously for that behavior. This of course comes back to like many things that we know, like knowing your individual and making sure that we're being function based, knowing what the reinforcer in place is. If you're gonna utilize behavioral momentum as an intervention, understanding the, the technicality of it and knowing the, the principles of response strength and the reinforcement history uh, will be very helpful for you to use it in the best way possible for the individual you're working with. If you like this video and want to check out some more like this, make sure to subscribe to our channel, hit the like option below, and thanks for tuning in.